says, Confucius says, the one who does good, the heaven will reward with good or blessings. The one for those who does evil, the heaven will reward him with evil or calamities. That's how he translates. So that's how it begins. Mm. And uh, the Confucius was asked then by his disciples, teacher, would you talk about some heavenly stuff? Uh, his book is all about living here. Mm. There's nothing to talk about the, uh, the heavenly kingdom. He talks about all current our living on earth. Mm. So the disciples asked him, would you talk about the heaven? His response was, I have a great difficulty understanding the living life on earth. How can I dare touch the heavenly subject? That was his response. Mm. So I thought you would like to know, there is a book similar, but again, it's an incomplete revelation looking mm. back. Mm. I mean, I, I read this many, many times when I was growing up, mm. practicing Chinese characters, but it's again, I didn't know it when I was a little. I thought it was a great book. It really helped me to be, uh, grow up thinking, meditating. Mm. But again, it's incomplete when I think about it. Mm. So mm. I'm just sharing for your curiosity. <coughs> That's definitely for my curiosity. You just read <laughs> Chinese characters. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, wow. So you speak Korean, English, and Chinese? Used to. German too, but it's all gone. It's all gone. <laughs> My wow. brain is damaged now. Wow. So. Yeah. Mine too. <laughs> it's all gone. <laughs> Thank you. Are there announcements? Uh, if anybody wants more of these pamphlets, I've got quite a few, but you're welcome to take as many as you need. Mm. I appreciate the input from a lot of people. <coughs> All right, then um, let's begin with prayer, and then we will dig in. Let's pray. We need to be <coughs> far more changed than we think we do. We are asking that that change would advance in this time. It surely includes the way we think, evaluate what we value, and how we choose to exercise our energies. It does seem, Father, from a book like Baxter's, that what I have omitted from my life is perhaps more grievous to you than what I have omitted from my life. Would you attenuate to our time the precision of your work, Holy Spirit, With all your piercing aim, please lead us and build us up in our faith. We're asking for this in Christ's name. <coughs> Amen. Let me begin. I took my finger out of where I wanted to begin reading. Return there. See if I can find it. Um, Oh, I shouldn't take my finger out. As soon as you started reading Chinese, Gail, I lost it. <laughs> um, I will find it. Here it is. Okay. Yes. So turn to a 77. I want to read this to you and um, give you a, a mental illustration and an example. <coughs> Bottom of uh, 77, take heed to yourselves because such great works as ours 
require greater grace than other men. Weaker gifts and graces may carry a man through in a more even course of life that is not liable to so great trials. Smaller strength may serve for lighter works and burdens. But if you will venture on the great undertakings of the ministry, if you will lead on the troops of Christ against Satan and his followers, if you will engage yourselves against the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, if you will undertake to rescue captive sinners out of the devil's paws, do not think that a heedless, careless course <clears throat> will accomplish so great a work as this. You must look to come off with greater shame and deeper wounds of conscience than if you had lived a common life, if you think to go through such momentous things as these with a careless soul. It is not only the work that calls for heed, but the workman also, that he may be fit for business of such weight. We have seen many men who lived as private Christians in good reputation for parts and piety when they took upon them either the magistrate, the magistracy, or, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, or military employment, where the work was above their gifts and temptations did overmatch their strength, they proved scandalous, disgraced men. And we have seen some private Christians of good esteem who, having thought too highly of their parts, and thrust themselves into the ministerial office have proved weak and empty men and have become greater burdens to the church than some who we endeavored to cast out. They might have done God more service in the higher rank of private men than they do among the lowest of the ministry. If then you will venture into the midst of enemies and bear the burden and heat of the day. Take heed to yourself. <clears throat> May I simply, let's say, can we just apply that to evangelism? And simply say, if you truly become involved with those who do not yet know Christ, if you really take everything that we've been looking at with this book, um, it will require that you take good heed to yourself. <coughs> Here's the illustration I'd like to give, and please forgive me for giving you what I call sermon slosh. <laughs> that um, I can't, when my own study affects me, it sloshes over, it's supposed to. But I hope that this helps, because what I have seen in terms of taking heed to myself is as I prayed my sins of omission. Do you remember when Mary went to Elizabeth after she was pregnant <coughs> and Joseph wanted to leave her and she headed into the presence of her aunt? Elizabeth, of course, told her of John the Baptist and the birth that was coming and that within her it was true, there really was Messiah. She prayed that you have brought down the kings on their thrones who were proud and have lifted up the humble. And Mary knew full well that Herod was still on the throne. And within months, he would carry out a campaign of murder to kill the children to get at her son. Scholars disagree as to how widely the deaths went. But nonetheless, he began to kill. So he's hardly off his throne. But she prayed, you have done this. She is either misled 
which I don't think she is, or she is thinking in a way that is different than I have thought and this book has pushed me. Here's my illustration and see if this helps. When Jesus came to the earth physically, he basically took a stick of dynamite and planted it inside of all that's evil, all that's sinful, all that's satanic, all that's suffering, all that's sordid, all that's wrong, and before he left the earth, he went and lit it. You are alive right now during the What Mary did when she prayed that prayer was she lived in light of the boom that was coming, not the pss that was here. The courage, the hope, the moving, good. It's only a matter of time before what's wrong is righted. What's gone is back. What's true is here again. It is only a matter of time. I'm going to keep pushing this. This is why I think the prophets are so confusing to us. Because they are basically time-lapse photography. One chapter, the prophet is warning and just letting you hear the psst, that's it. But in another paragraph, sometimes not even with a link, he shifts and goes immediately to the boom. All judgment is here. And then he goes back and just takes a picture of the initial shot when the explosion takes place. So you just see the boom. And just talks about Babylon or Assyria or Egypt. And then in the next chapter, he goes back to not only has the boom taken place, but God is ruling and all people are free and you get whiplash. Here's my point. To be involved in evangelism and to live only in light of the psst is foolish. We have to learn to live in light of the boom with deep hope. And this book has not just undermined my fear, and it's done a really good job at that, but it's helped me see that my fear is rooted more in hopelessness. I'm going to say that again. In hopelessness and an underestimation of the reality of the boom. Here's the last thing I'll say. It is stupid. It's stupid. It's foolish. It could be lethally stupid to hear the psst and not expect a boom. If I put dynamite out there and lit it, I could empty this room in a minute. Every one of you would know it is stupid to stay in the room. It's logical, reasonable realistic to live in light of that's going to go off. <clears throat> that's what Mary did. Being involved in evangelism requires your really believing it's only a matter of time <clears throat> before the boom comes. And living in light of that certainty so the big revelation for me from the whole book is, yes, my fear is wrong. But my fear is rooted in my hopelessness. I have not taken enough heed to how Satan has stolen my belief in the reality of Christ's certain healing of all that's wrong. And to participate now like Mary and live like it is only a matter of time. It has helped me 
in the way that I think about <clears throat> each person that I've met with much more hope, expectation. I keep saying this will be the last thing I'll say. This will be. I think Presbyterians live hopeless. And I think we're supposed to live hopeful. And that's what my charismatic brothers have taught me. They're better Calvinists than I am. That's what I've learned from the book. What's your response? <coughs> Actually, from, from, the, from your sermon slot, so on Sunday, um, the one thing that came to my mind, and maybe I'll step on some dynamite, but uh, <laughs> it's my, good. Thought, my vision of that instead was just like when, when the explosion happened, it happened in the Bill Center. So I rather thought that, that I would look at the ascension as when that boom started. <laughs> and that's why I would be hopeful that the promise has begun and that the power of the Holy Spirit now is accomplishing so much of what's involved in that boom. That's very so helpful. The power has already entered. Yeah, you've made <laughs> this even more convicting. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. You can I, correlate that to a fireworks show. Sorry, I was just thinking, like, the first one goes off, and you're like, hey, that's cool. But by the end, you're like, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, um, there was an address made in 1986 by a guy named J. Edwin Orr, a church historian at the National Prayer Conference. <clears throat> and just in my study for the Lord's Day, he noted that after the revolution, there were five million people that lived in America. And the statistics he then gave were absolutely incredible. 300,000 people of that five million, percentage-wise, that's really high, were all known addicted to alcohol. 300,000, that's the ones that were known. 1,500 were being buried every year from addiction-related deaths. The first time since the establishment of the colonies, women would not go out at night for fear of being assaulted. They did polls of Harvard and Princeton to see how many Christians were there. They were both started at that time. They were Christian schools. There was one. Christian at Harvard. There were two at Princeton. The most active group on Princeton's campus was, I can't remember the exact phrase, the Dirty Speech Club. There were only five students who weren't a member of it. They threw out the president and burned Nassau Hall. Bank robberies in, in America was one every day. The churches were declining at such rate that the Chief Justice of the United States of America contacted the Bishop of the Episcopal Church in Virginia and said, the church is done. Christianity is leaving the face of the colonies. This place was coming apart. And there was one guy named Erskine <laughs> in Edinburgh, Scotland, who started by writing something we read here. It was an appeal for united prayer. He sent it to a brand new pastor in America and said, you need this. Remember who it was? Jonathan Edwards. And he wrote the little piece on the concerted united effort for prayer. When people began to meet the power of the reigning king, one year after Wesley died, the Second Great Awakening broke out. And it began, it took over sections of Scotland, it swept from Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, and began to redefine 
the United States of America. Because one guy said, I'm going to live in light of the boom. And I'm going to start to pray like it. And it began to go. That's what this book has done to me. Joe, I'm going to make the two points and then I'm going <clears> to <throat> ask the question at the end. Uh, completing this book took me back to the very end of this book. And I will read one sentence for you. He's quoting Sunja, who was a philosopher around his time, who had the view all humanities are intrinsically evil which is similar to Christianity. And then he quotes his word that if you plan to set out a mile long journey, if you don't take the first step, you will never make it. <laughs> if you plan to make the big river, if you don't gather small tributaries, you will never make the big river. <laughs> so start from very small things takes me back to Joshua 3.13. <clears throat> I will read it to you. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, and the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and then they shall stand upon a heap. God is not asking us to do, begin, the work when we are in the deep water of the chest. Or he's asking, get your feet wet. Then I'll do the rest of the work. There you go. <clears throat> so that's the summary of this book to my heart. When I finished, I went to the end of this book, which was very convicting. And then, <clears throat> As I was listening to your sermon last Sunday at the church, God's providence, your sermon plus Pastor Juan, uh, Pastor Jun in South Korea, who's leading the revival, made it absolutely crystal clear to my brain. It was so helpful. So I was itching to share with you what I was revealed to me. Then I would ask the questions. <clears throat> when we visit each other, humans, if I visit you, Joe, first word is, how are you? Right? Uh, in Korea, we say, oh, or in America, how have you been? In Korea, because of the 950 wars, invasions over 4,000 year history, in the morning, greeting word is... Okay, how many invasions? 950 invasions over 4,000 years. Every four years, we were invaded every mm. by foreign invasions between China, Japan, and wow. our sandwich, just like Israel. Mm. So uh, the first greeting word is, how was your night? Because many people get during the night. And uh, another greeting word is, you have a breakfast because after work you don't have food to eat mm. so the greeting word is how was your night did you eat your breakfast is the greeting word in south korea or north korea too mm. in germany we just uh, talk we get a seat and see meaning how are you doing how have you been doing and in japan ohio but i must how are you doing now basically so think about that greeting human word. When human visits another human, it brings past to present. How have you been doing to this point? How are you now? That's our human visitation. When God visits you, different. Look at Abram. His greeting word is, look at the sky, the stars. I will make you great nation. 
out of you, Moses. I will use you to lead these two million people out of Egypt and take your promised land and make a great nation out of you. Look at the Jacob, Israel, same, on and on. So point is, when God visits human, he brings the epitome of the future to present to you. That's how God visits and puts in your heart. And that's the promise which Bunyan talks about in his Pilgrim's Progress, secret key in my bosom, which opens the dungeon's key, lock, mm. to get out. That's the promise we live with. Mm. Christ came, eternal salvation for you, if you follow me and believe me. Eternal future to present. So the clear distinction between human vegetation, past to the present, God's vegetation, future epic, bring to present, and make you live for him. And I was listening to your sermon last Sunday. I said, oh, look at the gods. Mm -hmm. I was listening to his sermon and your sermon and just put it together, and it just made it. I have understood, but I was not able to crystal clearly express it that way. And that was so <coughs> helpful, so I wanted to share that, what was revealed. I'm really scared about the question that's coming. Yes. <laughs> the question is, has the Holy Spirit visited you? No. Okay, let's pray. Yeah. <laughs> this is my question. If he did, what did he promise you? This is my question to you all finishing this book. <coughs> you make me think, uh, it's interesting that <coughs> the more pain a human goes through, 950 invasions, the, invasion. the more pain they go through, the shorter the past they ask about. <laughs> yeah. Did you make it through the night and have you eaten breakfast? Yeah. So the past narrows and the hopelessness grows. Yeah. I, and I'm thinking, um, became good friends with a Roman Catholic priest who had come to Lookout, who was from Poland. And when I, when I <coughs> met him, I said, my real name is Nowakowski. And my dad changed it, and he said, I will call you, use you. And I immediately started to cry. Because I hadn't heard that, which means little Joe, since my grandfather. Yeah. Mm. I, hadn't, I hadn't heard that word since he had died. Mm. And I just I went, oh my goodness. And then he said, we will greet each other the way we do in Poland. Now this is terrible Polish. If you can speak Polish, please forgive me. Jak bołoże po klawonie Jesu Christu. And then the other person goes, Jeko wieku, amen. So you don't say, hi, how are you doing? You say, praise be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the next person says, forever and ever, amen. You start there. And I went, still? And he went, not as many. <clears throat> people are not doing it as much. That was the impact of faith upon the Polish people. The greeting was, immediately, praise be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Forever and ever, future, amen. <clears throat> and I just thought, man, what a way to greet people. <laughs> Very correct. different. Yes. <clears throat> the one trivia is, but this may be the, possibly you may see some Jewish blood in myself in Korean. <laughs> but if you look at the unleavened bread, the Jewish people call bread of a haste, right? Mm. We have a very something similar in Korea. Mm. We have a wrap of a haste. We have a huge, the uh, fabric wrap. The mothers always keep, always keep. And if the war breaks out, you gotta run. She throws whatever she has to take it with her, jewelries, her family matters, whatever. And then tie it, put it on her head, and they carry the little ones on their back and then run. Wow. It's called wrap of haste. It's very similar mm. culture 
with the Jewish bread of the haste, bread of haste, wrap of haste. It's very similar nuance. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to put some teeth into the concept of the explosion. Whether, like he was saying, that explosion started and we're just slowly seeing this, or as I think you were saying, it's coming and it's going to really be life changing. Everything changes. Is it that we're supposed to live this life in light of the absolute? certainty that it's going to happen and have that uppermost in our mind as we're going through life and meeting people and talking is that you know the, the essence of what you were saying is that, that it's uppermost in our mind so that the urgency of and not like well life's going to go on like it is it's been going this way forever and it's gonna never, never going to end you know so why why you know why be anxious about it yeah not to be not to push the metaphor too far but yes in light to live in light of the certainty of the new heaven and the new earth but if I were to take what Dutton said I would uh, uh, and use the example of the fireworks it's often if you've gone and watched it's common now that they'll have one they'll go boom 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 <clears throat> and then it gets quiet and then boom yeah. happens <laughs> so I would say there's a way in which at his ascension there was a pretty big boom <clears throat> but there's a bigger one coming when everything that's wrong will be just utterly defeated so we're to live in light of that, that as, and we're to live in light of that and there are periodic times where those little booms break in they're called miracles when you pray, God, heal them, they do. And then we're all amazed. Some of you were here with the day Richard Pettit came and stood in that door and said, Spears Wilson woke up. And I got up and ran out because we'd met the day before to pray and anoint him. And he was in the um, intensive care unit, his body drawing up, his hands closing. The doctor said, his body's disconnected from the brain stem. He's He'll be dead soon. And his parents said, would you come and pray? And I'm thinking, I had, I had this much faith. <laughs> I didn't even have mustard seed faith. Mm. And we prayed, anointed him, left, nothing. Richard stayed all night praying. <coughs> and came to the door. Oh. There's one of those, boom, 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 before the, boom! And I hugged Spears four Sundays ago. I said, I love hug hugging a miracle. I just love it. Um, so is that, the, am I up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but just think of the think of the pessimism you hear among Christians about America. Oh my goodness. And the bitterness and the anger and the joining the weaponized words. <clears throat> and, you know, when I heard J. Benor talking about Revolutionary War, post times, and how the, I went, man, this is nothing. <laughs> and how they said, all right, we're going to get together and pray. And another boom shot through all of America at the Second Great Awakening. I bet you could trace, if you were looking at all the mission agencies that exist, they came out of the United States, not out of Britain. They came from the Second Great Awakening. They, they, they just went, and you'll see that they can trace back to there. Um, there were 600 colleges planted in the Midwest after the Second Great Awakening. 600 colleges all planted to teach people about Jesus. Many of them still exist, no longer to teach people about Jesus. Yes, I, can I do a quick follow-up to just uh, along those lines? Um, I always think of the fact, especially while you're talking about evangelism, that you know, Christ's departing words were, all power and authority has been given unto me. Now, go. And yeah. So to me, that's where we're, we're not just at the fist of anyone. Some of the boom has to have started for that statement. 
and the promise that, you know, I'm leaving and now you're going to get this whole experience. Mm -hmm. And nothing will stop the spread of the kingdom. <coughs> Well, those are, that really rings in my soul, not just my ears. I think of John Payton, Patton. Uh, a couple that went to the New Hebrides before he went, stepped yeah. on shore, and they were immediately killed. And eaten. And so you, you know, evil wins again, evil's got it. Mm. Uh, and John Payton is thinking no uh, the psst is going and there's power and you know, evil isn't going to win and so he goes and but when he went there was, well, wasn't a Christian in the New Hebrides when he left there wasn't a non-Christian in the New Hebrides mm -hmm. uh, you live knowing no uh, evil doesn't win doesn't doesn't it talk about um, in, in Hebrews doesn't it talk about um, tasting the powers of the world to come, or something like that. I'm not sure. It says, but it says um, something about the ones who have trampled. It's not good to trample on the blood of Christ. It's not good to, to uh, have tasted the powers of the world to come and then to turn away. Hebrews six. Right. Yeah. Hebrews six. Hebrews six. That it does say that, right? Okay. Well, to me, it seems like Hebrews six. Okay. But um, it seems like to me that seems to me that when we talk about already but not yet, the um, our eschatology stuff um, about how the there's uh, there's um, the boom coming and the already is is the uh, fizz or something like that. Um, I or the fizz of the the line going to the bomb, but um, I think. Um, I think that there's, like you're saying, Joe, I think there's more booms here than we might think, uh, that, than maybe in the, as Presbyterians we uh, are aware of even, actually. Well, just think about how many people are meeting uh, once, once a week, is it? Gil? Once a week, some millions of people on the street right now. Every Saturday, Sunday, on Seoul, they're meeting. Rain or sun shining, it doesn't matter. They are meeting. Every so preaching day. and worship and prayer. Yeah, on the street. Now you can you can Google it and see it, yeah. but you won't see it in the news. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but I mean, when a million people meet to worship and pray once a week in downtown Seoul, in a major international city, that's a boom. Yeah. <coughs> 12 lane streets on each side is 12 lane and they block half of it so you occupy 12 lane street by long with <coughs> loud speakers with the portable parties and they meet and I bet and then John keep going with your thought but I bet the revolution that <coughs> happened in Korea well the, the, the riots there weren't a million people no, no, they're not rioting. They I know, I know. Yeah. But just, but that made the news. Yeah. But a million doesn't. So back to your point, there are a lot more booms <coughs> than I think we're aware of. Yeah, and they don't have to be um, extra biblical things necessarily. Like the, you know, for instance, I'm thinking of like um, charismatics might say, well, this happened and other people in Christendom say, well, that probably, you know, there's probably a natural explanation for it. But it doesn't even have to be that that category of thing. I don't, I think, because um, what I mean is, for instance, like last Saturday, I heard an evangelist speak. You were mentioning that evangelists sometimes focus on the fizz, but not on the boom. Well, I heard an evangelist speak last Saturday who said something like, if God had a voice, and then he, he said, would it sound like, and I, I was thinking, if he had a voice, <laughs> if God had a voice? And, but I, I had to leave mid-sermon mid, uh, because I had to go to work. But I was left with that thought, and that God has a voice. And, and, like, um, uh, and he was a Presbyterian 
and I'm sure, our, I'm and sure. <laughs> <laughs> so to me it reminds me of Schaefer's book he is there and he is not silent mm -hmm. it says he the title of the book he is there and he is not silent and I think that's exactly true <clears throat> and it's the scriptures he's talking about I believe mm -hmm. I I've read part of that book I haven't read the whole thing but I think he's talking about the scriptures mm -hmm. so that is the scriptures are not some extra biblical thing that his voice is coming from some extra biblical boom um, it's the scriptures that's his voice is here and so anyway I <laughs> so we have a current hope we have a current hope and the already but not yet it's not just not yet it's all it's already we taste of the powers to come because we have this if you I'm just I'm remembering a conversation I think I've spoken about here that connects with this. Um, Elmer Thompson is the founder of World Team Missions. Um, and he was speaking at a church I was serving. And I just lost probably four or five of my friends in ministry had, had moral collapses and were now out of ministry. And I hadn't been in ministry for five years. And they'd already tubed out. And I sat down next to him. We were eating apple pie after dinner. And I said, Mr. Thompson, may I ask you a question? What is wrong with my generation? I mean, we must have been missing something. How can this happen? And told him about the guys. And without even looking up from his apple pie, he said, you don't know how to trust God. <laughs> just, just like that. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? He said, you don't. You have to have everything organized. You have to have everything planned. He said, you know how World Team started? I was called to Cuba. I packed my bags and I flew to Cuba. And I said, no support? He said, no support. Were you married? Yes. What'd your wife think? She was called to. <laughs> Get off the airplane and go, all right, Jesus, we're here. Now what? <laughs> the, the sense of living in light of the one who has all power and authority <laughs> said to do it and going and doing it. And he said, your generation knows nothing of that. And as a result, they're living on power of the flesh and set your watch. Um, instead of a positive boom, the negative one will be blown to bits. And just, woo! We didn't even look up from his apple pie. <laughs> um, but there's truth in that. Great truth in that. What are you thinking, Scott? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you. Thinking of the difference between a Baptist and a Presbyterian. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> My Baptist husband packed his suitcase and went to Brazil. With three months of support that he had earned himself. Uh, what, he what came back it? and married a Presbyterian. We went with eight barrels. <laughs> 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 I love it. <laughs> thank, thank you, Sally. Thank you. I mean, I think that, thanks for saying that. Um, I'm just saying, for many of, I'm close to your age, but for many of the younger people here, for someone who has served the way that to be as vulnerable, thank you. It gives the rest of us hope to repent and believe and be faithful to well, live in light of the boom. And I think that, that echoes the section six on page 77 because he says, he basically is asking, what kind of life are you planning for? Yeah. Are you planning for an even course or are you planning for great trials? And he says the grace will come in the great trials. And you know, to give a personal form, it's <coughs> watching Jesus who is the suffering servant. Joe and I were talking about this, but you know, D.A. Carson said the kingdom of God came as a great surprise, completely unexpected with blessings, but it came through a suffering servant. So the life of great trial that we're called to live, you know, I just find myself over and over again influenced by the world to think of an even course. 
you know, of the eight barrels, as opposed to the three months in the suitcase, you know. And but when I get close to Jesus and I see the personal form of how the kingdom comes, it comes through a suffering servant who brings great blessing, but also has great trials, you know. And uh, I don't know why that's so hard to step into those shoes, but that's that seems to be the personal form that we're given when before the bomb explodes, you know, before the dynamite goes off. We're supposed to we're supposed to have great trials and great grace. I I wanted to mention about twenty years ago when that time we went to that Can you speak conference. up so we, we can went hear you. to a, a conference about twenty, twenty five years ago, uh, uh, at a small church out on Lee Highway. And the 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 organization leader said that they had always did this conference in Washington, D.C. They had never had this, this meeting any other place. But God told them to go to Chattanooga, Tennessee and do a conference. And they said that the next great awakening would come out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh, that scares the little down. <laughs> and, and I'll be honest with you, y'all yeah, been in the church my whole life, but I've never been as excited about church Jesus Christ or anything concerning the church until I entered this group. And and now I'm going to look out mountain prayers is I I, I I feel it coming. I, I, I see it. Um I'm looking for the sky to split any day. <laughs> I wonder um that's thrilling and terrifying all at once. May it be, may it be, may it be. Um, I'm wondering if it's going to come from Seoul, Korea. It, it would be like it would be like Jesus to take all the proud Anglo's and bow them low as he transforms his world. But anyway, I part of the reason that I think our sense of management what I'll call it, has gone amok. Our first command was to have dominion, to get control. And sin is never original. Satan and sin are never original. God creates with his word, so Satan deconstructs with his word. Did God really say? All he can do is copy what's happened. Sin is always the twist of something that exists. And our call to dominion, management, has become twisted. And we can't even see it because it's so deep in us. And America so encourages us. How much do you got here? 401k. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm 67. If I hear another one of my pastor friends say that, I'm going to spit. I'm saying, guys, how many years do we got left? Let's go for it. Um, the, the sense of management has gone amok because it's more in light of what I will do for me and how will I burn for you. Um, it's very, it's gotten out of hand. Yeah, Ron. Uh, <clears throat> that question of are things getting better, are things in decline, that eschatology uh, framework of the kingdom is now and not yet helped me a lot because you see evidence in both. If you are limited to the news, we are determining um, we are determining how we're doing by each news cycle or by each election. I keep going back to you know how are you talking about society based on who's which party is in power? Yeah. Um, you know, if you're shaped by that political culture or by the church, um, you know, are you reading books that say the church is in decline. We're in a terrible place compared to some time in the past. Or are you reading mission reports of the gospel advancing? And if you find yourself only seeing one side, go somewhere where there's evidence of the other side. Um, in, in our little silos, we tend to see one or the other. Um, and then, um, so what determines your answer to that question, who's winning? Um, Staying in scripture and being disciplined to read different parts of scripture um, helps you see the evidence of both things being, being brought about. Even in the life and ministry of Jesus, 
Um, he said the kingdom is closer than it's ever been. <laughs> and they were under the control of Rome. The church was full of hypocrites and moralists. Um, and yet he saw seeds and he said, look at it in terms of seeds and growth, uh, long-term growth. <laughs> the final thing I've heard it in terms of, um, you know, the victory is won and we're in a mop-up operation. And I was just picturing scenes from Hacksaw Ridge, I guess, over oh, the man. end. Oh. And whether you've won or lost the battle, uh, there are people who can, who are dying. <laughs> and, um, you know, they would say, you've saved people's life, you know, uh, Rejoice, you know, this is awesome. He said, There's one more. Yeah. And he climbed back, um, the hero of the story. And this guy looks dead, but I think I see some movement. And yes. let, let me just take one more. And he goes down the cliff and brings him out. Um, so that scene in that movie when he's just dropped one more and he's sitting right on the edge of the cliff. And he says, Lord, I can't hear you. And the bombs are just dropping all around him. I don't know what to do. And he hears in the smoke of the bomb drop behind him, medic! And he just gets up and runs right into the smoke. I just, I lost it. Um, the very thing. Yeah. And just went right back and got another one. Um, that is, a, that's quite a film. Hacksaw Ridge. Short time before I became a Christian. Tim Elliott and Nate Saint, some others were killed by the who is uh, Indian and a became a Christian and read the book uh, The Shadow of the Almighty, Two Gates of Splendor, really impacted my life of what they had done. I got to a, a church as a young pastor and uh, former retired missionaries who'd grown up in Korea were talking, that was, that was foolish what they did. I don't really think that was wise at all. Mm. Should have probably mm. never happened mm. down in the office. It, it impacted my life, though. Why? Well, it wasn't organized in the sense, you know, mm -hmm. they shouldn't have done that. They should have checked things beforehand. That wasn't safe, but they did. They didn't have to do that. There are other ways to <coughs> be more diligent in planning and organization and safety, and da, 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 which is all true. But I wonder how many lives were changed. God used the quote foolishness that Jim Elliott and others did. Hmm. How many missions have started? How many people went to <coughs> fill their shoes throughout the world? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's true they could have been more organized. They could have packed more you know, barrels to get down there, whatever. But uh, maybe we are. How much do you have you 401k is not the wisest question mm -hmm. to ask. Well, you said fool, and it's the Jim Elliott quote that he is no fool who gives yes, the game cannot, cannot keep. Keep the game when he cannot lose. Plus, we've the, been to the village, and they're all... <laughs> right now, it's... <laughs> you've, been, you've been to the village? <laughs> Christian yes. village, yeah. And they're all believers. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And they all have six beds. <laughs> <laughs> For real? <laughs> One fun family. It's a had genetic <laughs> thing. And the dugout canoe that was. But That's the book we're, we're reading after this is Elizabeth Elliot's The Path of Loneliness. Yeah. One of the men rowing the canoe was then a teenager who killed those men, one of them, three or four. And just, just her thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to go back there and finish what my husband started. Yeah. With the baby with which I'm pregnant from him that he never saw. Right. Mm -hmm and finds her translator, and he turns out to be the one who killed her husband. That's foolish. That's how he's foolish. Elizabeth Elliot doesn't strike me, though, as, sorry, uh, she doesn't strike me as somebody who just, you know, um, does foolish things. So it sounds to me like she was called to do it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm. I'd say so. <laughs> <laughs> I was something that Sally said several months ago that's just stuck with me. And that is we took our kids to get a good education so they can get a good job so they can earn a good living. Rather than has God called this child and what can this person do in terms of the kingdom? I think of it with um, Kenneth Scott Lateran who went to mission to China as a missionary and 
after a year and a half his health broke. So he came back and became a his professor of history at Yale. And when he turned 70, this is in the, in the book, his previous students who were seminary and university professors had a big uh, festival in his honor since they were academics, they all wrote papers. <laughs> they gave him 30 minutes to talk about his life. And he summarizes it with five questions. What is there go what, that God wants done in the world? Who is there to do it? Has God given me some specific ability that might contribute to it? Therefore, what should I be doing? In other words, how can I best cooperate with God? Well, I have discovered that fits anybody in any situation. What does God want done? Who is there to do it? He ended up seeing that nobody had ever written a history of the expansion of Christianity around the world, missions. So he wrote a 10 volume history. Um, has God given me some ability that might contribute? Well, that was his major history, so that's what he did. Uh, the interesting thing is, looking back, he changed the way history is done in the Western world. Before him, nobody ever went back to original sources. Since then, if you don't go back to original sources, you haven't done your proper history. But what he did was take the mission reports from all of the different mission agencies and so forth. And when I was reading the chapter, the book on Oceania, the um, Welsh um, Revival, um, Oceania, oh, the uh, Pacific. Okay. Um, and I was out in the Pacific for a year and a half, and so I paid attention to what had been going on and all that sort of thing. When the Welsh Revival hit in Wales, mm -hmm. this person in the Marshall Islands, another missionary, read about it. Holy Spirit. This person in the Gilbert Islands read about it. It went all over the world. We only hear about the Welsh Revival. Mm -hmm. But the impact even of just reading people's letters Hmm. Say those five again, because it's 7.30, and that'll be a good summary of the book. What are they? Uh, what is there God wants done in the world? In other words, what's God's purpose? Uh, who is there to do it? If it needs to be done, who is there to do it? Has God given me some specific ability that might contribute? In this case, it was history. Therefore, what should I be doing? In other words, how can I best cooperate with God? Amen. Hey, Joe, can I have one more? Yeah. Just that in the midst of this whole conversation, <clears throat> I heard a great comment once that when we can get the heat of the charismatics and the light of the Presbyterians put together, sure. won't it be great? Ah. So, <laughs> well, yeah. the, um, the thing that you can trace revival to is exactly that happening. The Second Great Awakening came when every Monday in the United States of America, Methodists, Moravians, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, all agreed that they would pray. And the walls fell down between and out it went. Okay, next week, we're here, I've got one left, and I suggest we only go through page 10. Um, I don't think we should do more than that. You gotta read real slow. It's, this is, uh, and if you wanna speed up, we can, but I'll order more. Let's close in prayer. Now it is us. We have been entrusted with these moments. It is our generation. Lord, have mercy upon us. And in your great power, grant grace that we might approximate obedience and faith and repentance
commensurate with the promise of your provision. Come and help us in this moment. In Jesus' name.